praise be to thee, O Christ, in the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we have uh, in the gospel lesson for this morning um, what is really the second lesson, uh, if, you, if you put it in comparison to uh, the lesson from last week. The lesson from last week uh, being Jesus' experience in, in Nazareth, his own hometown, well, where you'll remember that he was rejected, in fact, driven from the town and, uh, and going to be thrown off a cliff. And yet in this, uh, in this lesson, uh, we have now Jesus uh, coming to the, to the city of Capernaum. Uh, and so in many ways, it's, this is the tale of two cities. You know, in, uh, John Dickens, or in Charles Dickens' novel, The Tale of Two Cities, it was a comparison between Paris and, and London during the, during the French Revolution. Um, this is the tale of two cities who had two very different um, very different approaches to Jesus, uh, very different responses to the proclamation that he gave. And it is really two different ways uh, for not only cities or communities, but also lives to be able to respond to him. Uh, in in, in uh, Capernaum, uh, Jesus comes. So Nazareth is uh, down to the south. It's more inland. It's where you will remember that Jesus was raised uh, in his, his own hometown. But Capernaum is farther up to the north, and it's right on the Sea of Galilee. It's where numbers of his disciples would have come from as fishermen. And so we meet uh, Simon a little bit later on in this lesson. So he comes to Capernaum, and, uh, and there must have been some trepidation, certainly they would have heard the, the, uh, the reception that he got in Nazareth, this sense of, of shock at who Jesus was, what he was, this affinity that he had with, uh, with the Gentiles, and this, this uh, outrage, this anger in his own hometown to, to throw him out. But he comes to Capernaum, and he preaches in their synagogue, and, uh, and a very different kind of reaction happened. So it begins in the passage just immediately before this. Jesus, we don't know the sermon that he would have preached, but, uh, but there certainly is an appreciation, um, a, a, a receptiveness, an openness to the presence of Jesus among them. And, and they're struck by the power of his words. Uh, and then uh, in the midst of the service, I, we can't tell whether it's immediately, uh, immediately during the service or immediately after the service, um, there, are, there are people who have demons um, who are within them, uh, people who, uh, who uh, those demons are speak out and they, and they reveal themselves to him. And it's, it becomes clear that there are certain things that are happening because of the ministry of Jesus, because of this proclaiming. So the first thing, I suppose, that, that happens is that Jesus comes and he proclaims a message. And this message is this message of the kingdom, that God's kingdom is moving among us, that his, uh, it is the good news of this new way of being able to live. And it's, it is expansive in terms of God's revealing himself and coming among us and bringing people um, to us. And as Jesus' message comes to us, we have to make a choice because that message you know, begins, to, begins to sift us it begins to evaluate us about who it is that we are and the kinds of things that we care for. The people in Nazareth were offended at the message because the idea of Jesus bringing in, the Ge bringing in Gentiles and, in and including Gentiles in the community was offensive to them, and so they rejected Jesus. But that same message, this message, the good news of the kingdom, this forming of the community of God's love for the people of God, for these folks in Capernaum, was, that, was, that was an exciting thing. It was an opportunity to be able to open themselves to the people who were around them in new and very powerful ways. But whether it's offensive or exciting depends on our perspective. 
where it is that Jesus wants to take us will depend on the condition of our hearts and whether we're prepared to go there because his kingdom challenges us. It, it challenges us to the root of who we are and whether we are prepared to be people of, people of grace and people of openness and people who are ready to do God's work. Um, I, I remember uh, pretty clearly, uh, probably now 30 years ago, uh, being at a convention uh, uh, for the diocese in, uh, in Detroit, Michigan. And it was at a time when racial tensions were pretty high. And, uh, and the bishop and the cathedral was, in, uh, was downtown in Detroit. And we had a, the theme of convention had to do with race and how it was that we were going to kind of build a community uh, together that was unified, even though um, we were divided in many ways and race and economic, uh, ec economic uh, levels was very uh, different in different parts of the diocese. And I remember the bishop uh, getting up in his address and his saying to, uh, to the convention, he said, I, uh, I, I am a racist, he said. And then he went on to spell out that, uh, that, uh, that he, he was raised as a white man in privilege in the Northeast. And, uh, and so uh, as he looked at his brothers and sisters who were raised in the inner city in, De in Detroit, he said to them, he said, I don't know what it was like for you to grow up in this place with the struggles and the challenges that you faced. I don't know what it was like for you to face in the mornings the kinds of, of, of lack of opportunities that you had in the days that you, that you lived through. He said, but I need you to help me. I need you to be able to fill in the blanks. I need you to be able to speak to me about what your experience was. I need you to tell me what it was like for you and what it is like for you so that we can come together and determine what our priorities are about how it is that we move forward. You know, there's, there's just something about the bishop being willing to step forward and to say, I am a racist. In a world where um, people clamor <laughs> to run from those words and to say, I'm not a racist. Who's a racist? I'm not a racist. Are you a racist? I'm not a racist. He's a racist. He's the one. He's the, he is. Not me. I'm not a racist. But to embrace the reality that for all of us, when it comes to facing relationships with people who are very different than we are, there is this sense of, of fear and trepidation and a willingness to wall ourselves off and not to embrace the opportunity to be able to listen and to be able to grow and to be able to bond in ways that this new kingdom of God invites us to. So this movement of God's kingdom and his message first buffets us, it comes against us, it challenges us, it, it affects what we now call kind of our sinfulness and, and asks us to step back and to look and to evaluate the old Ignatian uh, spiritual method was this opportunity every day to do an assessment of, so Lord God, how did I do today? Given your kingdom and who it is that you're asking me to be, how did I do today? Um, was I kind? Was I generous? Was I a person of your kingdom? And how can I, in the day to come, tomorrow, how can I um, reposition myself, reconfigure my heart so that I will be able to respond more successfully to the challenges that tomorrow brings? This message of the kingdom comes first to us as a confrontation but a confrontation out of love that brings freedom for us. And so these people who were 
filled with the presence of evil in them are not the people on the other side of the world and not the people next door, but they're us. And the opportunity to see Jesus remove that evil from within us and to free us up to be his people. And then the other piece that happens in the message of the kingdom that Jesus always does is he always provides healing. He provides healing for the broken and for the sick who come. And in particular, in this, in this gospel lesson, he provides healing for, uh, for Peter's mother-in-law. That's a precious thing, isn't it? So Simon, in this lesson, is Simon Peter. Peter, the first of the disciples, although he's not been called yet. Peter's not been called yet as a disciple. Um, first, we meet Peter as Simon, and what we know of him is that he's got a sick mother-in-law. And so what is it that Jesus is going to do but that he goes to Simon Peter's house and he goes to bring healing to Simon Peter's mother-in-law. He brings healing not just to us as individuals, but he also brings healing to us as we are situated in families. In families, you know. Um, of all of the nuclear family uh, struggles, uh, oftentimes there's, there are these, these struggles that have to do with power and the position of mother-in-laws. Um, I remember uh, this, this story about a young police officer who was being trained in, uh, to make sure that he was objective in all of his responsibilities. And his commanding officer who was doing the training said, now, he says, now what's gonna happen? What are you gonna do if you pull over a car who's speeding and uh, you pull it over, and then you realize that, uh, that the driver in the car is your mother-in-law. What will you do? And he thought for a minute, he said, call for backup. <laughs> um, this sense that oftentimes there are these traditional conflicts within families, right? This, this, uh, this question of how it is that we, that we will continue to kind of vie for the affections and care for the people who are most dear to us and how we fear over losing those things. Jesus comes into the, into the house where Simon Peter lived and he goes to Simon Peter's mother-in-law and doesn't just simply allow the, her to stay upstairs while the meal goes on, but touches her and brings healing to her. And... Uh, and uh, and the fellowship then of the meal and the bonding of the family is able to happen because of this healing. And then in Luke's gospel, it's just after this that the calling of Peter happens as Jesus' disciple. You know, the calling for us into, into the ministry of Jesus only happens because of the healing that Jesus does in our lives to the extent that Jesus heals in our lives. So to the extent that God's message works in us, that he transforms us, that he touches us, that he frees us, that he heals us, now all of a sudden we have this, this capacity for, for affection, for love, for care, for passion, for being able to see happen in the lives of others what it is that Jesus has done in my own life. And this outpouring of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness to those who before were our enemies and even those that were closest to us. It really is uh, the ministry of God's kingdom that allows us to be who we were created to be, allows us to break the dam of our own intransigence, our own selfishness, and to flood the world around us with his love. It's captured best, I think, in, uh, in the epistle lesson for this morning uh, that Jim read. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, uh, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast 
but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor th others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For where we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I fought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, I s we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, the one made possible because of the gift of Jesus for us, the greatest of these, is love.